Hi, everybody. Hello. Can you all hear me through the microphone? Good. Welcome to the Starco Planetarium. Thank you all so much for joining us. Um, my name is Eric Johnson. I'm the director of the Planetarium. And it's always my pleasure to be able to serve as a host for the James B. Kaler Science Lecture Series, where we invite speakers uh, from various scientific fields to come to the Planetarium and give a talk about their areas of expertise. It's always really a lot of fun to get a wide variety of sciences under the dome here. Um, so we're glad you can join us for that. Um, I'll mention here at the beginning, for those of you who are coming here for a class, uh, we just put out a sign-up sheet out at the uh, ticket counter that after the talk is done you can put your name on there to show as a record that you had attended this okay so um, some people were asking about that and I went and made sure to set that up beforehand here so um, I want to before I hand over the microphone and actually get behind that camera over there uh, I want to introduce uh, Professor Tuja Basser here um, she is a professor over at the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering is that correct? That's correct. Okay, Whew, good job me. Alright. <laughs> um, anyways, uh, she earned her bachelor's degree in geological engineering at uh, Jukurova University in Turkey and then she went off to the University of California at San Diego to get a PhD in geotechnical engineering. Um, she did a postdoc at the University of Alberta and eventually joined the University of Illinois in 2018. Okay, um, So she's earned lots of great awards for her research and for her lecturing and I'm really looking forward to seeing what she has to tell us about uh, geothermal en energy and what she does with geothermal energy. Um, this is going to be really a cool talk and I hope to see what sort of questions you folks might have. Um, if you do have questions, how would you like to uh, have them? I would mentions? prefer them during the talk. Okay. You know, instead of waiting until the end, you know, so some you know thoughts could be lost. So um, if he, if anything pops up while I speak uh, and introduce new concepts, please uh, interrupt me and then ask questions. Excellent. Thank you so much. So uh, if you do raise your hand, we'll try to make sure we get a microphone on you. Okay, so that you can actually ask that question. Um, that way it's being recorded. We've been trying to put these lectures um, to be available on uh, Parkland College's YouTube channel and to be shown on Parkland College television uh, after these talks. Um, so I'll be operating the camera to make sure that we're focused on our speaker and on those people who are asking questions. So without further ado, let's welcome Professor Bazer here. Um, Thank you so much again for coming to join us this evening. Of course. Thank you so much for the invitation. <laughs> Good evening, folks. I'm so happy and excited to be here today. I am today talk is going to be about geothermal energy, uh, geothermal energy systems and geothermal energy, uh, as you can see from the title. Uh, I would love to um, first introduce what we are doing uh, as a researcher. Uh, so first. Uh, so, um, Eric did the introductions, but I like to tell a little bit more about what I do as my daily job. Um, as an assistant professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, my specialty is geotechnical engineering, and geotechnical engineers deal with bridge foundations for bridges, dams, uh, landfill design, and you know all the stuff that is under the ground. So that's why it's usually people do not see what we do because everything we do in the ground and then it's not visible to eyes. So you see those like nice uh, superstructures, infrastructure and skyscrapers like in Chicago. Uh, but our work, unfortunately, it's, you know, remains silent, I guess. Um, but uh, and as, as a researcher, uh, as a faculty, I have three different responsibilities, major responsibilities. The first one is to do research, uh, the research of my expertise, including geothermal energy. And the second one is to teach, because the university pays me to teach. <laughs> and then the third one is to do service to my community. The service, uh, including my disseminate my research findings uh, to public and educate public and to, to bridge you know, the gap between the research, because in our world, we are in our little labs and, or as out in the field, we do our research, but it needs to be translated somehow. We do translate it into building codes and such, or design uh, uh, procedures, but 
uh, of course, we would like to talk about uh, what we do and how it's going to be impactful for society and how it's going to help. So a little bit, you know, a disclaimer. <laughs> um, so I will be using the term climate change, but I just want to make sure that this is not a political opinion. <laughs> uh, it's rather the, the data that has been collected and analyzed uh, related with climate uh, and weather events. So we have seen some anomalies uh, if, you look at, if we look at the uh, trajectory and we are going to see a lot more anomalies in the future. That's the prediction that the data science tell us. As a researcher, my job is to look at data and use it, analyze it and then predict. Okay. So as a civil engineer, uh, although I did my bachelor's degree in geological engineering, but now I work with uh, civil engineers and I teach civil engineering. In the past, there was a very linear relationship for me. So my understanding from civil engineering was, okay, so there's a problem, poor access to water, sanitation, housing and energy. So I would improve the infrastructure, then society would have access to clean water, electricity, sanitation, and transport. And the outcome is improve social, uh, improve society and communities. They're happy. But relate in turn, because those events, extreme weather events, we have been experiencing hazards, natural hazards, including tornadoes, hurricanes. As a matter of fact, I was just down in Florida in Fort Myers Beach. Uh, to investigate how Hurricane Ian impacted the areas, especially uh, surface infrastructure, including buildings. So it was, a, it was like a war zone. It was very heartbreaking for me. I was there for five days, but every day when we went to the field, you know, to document what happened there, it was, you know, it was a big emotional toll for everyone. So these events are increasing, the uh, occurrence of these events are increasing. And when people die, they turn into disaster, right? And of course, when we have a disaster, people, for example, uh, from the soci societal aspects, people don't want to live in that area anymore, some of them. And they move to other big uh, cities where um, there are no problems, including Chicago, for example, right? And that increases the urban development. And when the urban development is uh, increasing, then we will unfortunately have some CO2 emissions generated into the atmosphere because of using um, concrete uh, and cement. So also, um, so while we're uh, ur urban uh, urbanizing, uh, there are some greenhouse gas emissions uh, are being emitted into the atmosphere. If you look at residential and commercial buildings contribution of a uh, greenhouse gas emissions, it's um, more, a little bit more than 32%. So then it kind of, so these events, if we just, you know, circle back to our linear relationship. So this is not a linear relationship anymore. It's rather a feedback loop. It's a non, highly nonlinear relationship and there's a feedback loop here. You see how increased greenhouse gas emissions is affecting uh, climate change impacts and that needs to be implemented to uh, we have to introduce adaptation in this case and mitigation and here our infrastructure improvement uh, to be able to achieve this improved social outcomes we will we have to work a little bit more than ever to address these issues and put them into our equation to develop a nonlinear relationship. So there are some actions uh, are taken uh, in the, across the world. So one of them includes United Nations and Department of Economic and Social Affairs Sustainable Development highlighted areas that we need to work on as researchers, as society, uh, to, to be able to overcome these challenges. So which of these include that is exactly um, directly related with us is affordable cl and clean energy uh, pr providing to the communities to, to have equitable uh, uh, society. Reduce, so by doing this we will be reducing inequalities and we will be contributing to the climate action. 
So what we are doing, my research group is doing, I have a group of um, doctoral students, PhD students, master's students, and including a postdoc. So we are responding, so climate change has three major endeavors, including prediction, mitigation, and adaptation. So we are focusing on especially mitigation here to reduce the impact of that climate change by using different techniques, uh, including harvesting geoenergy, which I'm gonna get to it in a bit. And I've, I'm using, I'm, we've been performing research on these uh, front, including prediction of thaw rate, for example, permafrost thaw rate in the Arctic region. So then we uh, integrate our research findings into our education in the, at the undergrad level or grad level uh, to educate or to graduate more globally aware um, future engineers. So um, if we just you know, remember that pie chart, the energy uh, uh, sector, it's all about energy. So increasing population increases energy demand. So we have to come up either sustainable approaches like, you know, maybe sustainable oil and gas uh, extraction or come up with new energy resources. So if we look at U.S. primary energy consumption by energy source in 2021, you see we have petroleum 36 percent, natural gas 32 percent. Uh, natural nuclear electric power coal and renewable energy renewable energy only uh, includes 12 percent of this total uh, energy supply if we focus on geothermal energy which is a subject of this talk it's only two percent so how many of you heard that geothermal has this enormous potential to provide us sustainable and renewable energy Yes. So we've been talking about it. We know this for a fact, but yet there is only 2% of geothermal contribution in our efforts. So why is that? So you, you see 27% is wind here, 19% uh, hydroelectric, even like solar energy, uh, it's 12%. So there is a big discrepancy. So if we focus on other renewable energy resources, including wind, solar, compared to geothermal systems, so they have an intermittent nature, meaning they do depend on uh, diurnal patterns, weather patterns. For example, if we uh, just you know, look at solar uh, energy, it depends on the amount and angle of sunlight. So if you have a cloud today, the energy that you're gonna generate is going to change or it's going to be less than a sunny day. I'm sure all of you have seen these wind turbines, especially around Gilman, if you drive up to Chicago. So it really depends on wind speed and air density. So these are the major parameters affecting how much energy we can get. On the other hand, so this is our main motivation. So this is a temperature map of our country. So subsurface temperature or ground temperature. As you can see, uh, this is nicely distributed. There is a belt here, a uh, light green belt. If we focus on our state, Illinois, so the ground temperatures are about 50, 55 degrees. So what can we do with this energy? Uh, what can we do with this temperature values? We can develop geothermal energy. We can take advantage of geothermal energy. So geothermal energy comes from the constant uh, heat budget of Earth. So there is magma here. So there is a convective cycle happening in the magma. And then that convective cycle, which is a form of heat transfer, it transfers heat and then it dissip dissipates until it reaches the, the, uh, the outer core of our Earth then so there is a continuous cycle here okay so that's why we are not losing anything it's there it's constant and it's not changing why not take advantage of it so this is how geothermal system is being developed taking advantage of the heat but constant heat budget of earth 
So there are, so the geothermal energy is the available energy to us, available heat to us. What is the geothermal energy system is? This is how the different approaches that we take advantage of that energy. So these include geothermal heat pumps. Hydrothermal resources, they're naturally available. They just form because uh, as a result of geological processes. So there are different types of um, hydrothermal systems, including flash or binary power plants. And this, we have enhanced geothermal systems. How many of you heard about enhanced geothermal? So I'm sure you heard about geothermal heat pumps or ground source heat pumps before, but how about enhanced geothermal systems? I see one hand here, good. Enhanced geothermal systems, meaning a geothermal system requires three major parameters for electricity production. So the first one is water. You need to have water in the subsurface. The second one is you need to have high temperatures, higher thermal gradients. And the third one is a fracture system. In some cases, we do not have that fracture system or water. This is where we induce that. It's, it's very similar to hydraulic fracking. Have you heard of hydraulic fracking before? So this is for enhancing oil and gas extraction. We are doing the same thing here. We're injecting highly pressurized water into the subsurface. We are cracking the rock material, and then we are creating our own fracture systems so that when we inject cold water, this water is traveling through the cracks, and then it heats up, and then we get it from the production wells, and it goes to our power plant. And also direct use. Uh, we, have a, uh, we have multiple projects going on on the University of Illinois camp, uh, Urbana-Champaign campus. I'm going to introduce them uh, in a bit. So this is a really nice thermometer that was developed by the Department of Energy in 2019. So this is from a report called GeoVision. GeoVision is an amazing report. It's a little bit long, but I highly really recommend if you're interested to go to the report. It's, it's not written, uh, it doesn't use a lot of jargon, it's, it's, it's easy to follow, it's easy to understand, it explains why uh, it's important to tap into the geothermal potential uh, in our country or in the world, and how much energy we can get potentially from if we are to utilize and use all those energy available to us. You see different applications for food processing, greenhousing, um, fish farming, uh, geothermal heat pumps, so some of these actually exist on our campus. And one interesting thing that I want to point out is that um, I usually divide these geothermal systems by two, categorize them by two. The first one is low temperature, the second one is high temperature. Low temperature, it's up to 200 or 150 degrees. This is, these are the conditions that we use the heat for heating and cooling purposes. If we encounter higher temperatures than 150, that means we can use them for electricity production. So low temperature, high temperature, heating and cooling, and electricity production. Another thing to, to, to keep in mind as we move on in the talk, there are two major systems to a, any geothermal system. The first one is a surface infrastructure. The second is ground loop, period. If it's for electricity production or uh, heating and cooling, doesn't matter, surface and subsurface. So um, we started tapping into this potential back in 1950s, maybe even before that by developing ground source heat pumps. So ground source heat pumps are easy to install, very easy to use, and very basic principle. We drill trenches or boreholes. The boreholes vertical, trenches horizontal, or even we use pond. We install a closed loop system. This is where we circulate a fluid through the pipes. And you see this is my ground loop. And then this ground loop is attached to a heat pump in our houses or in our buildings. It can be for a uh, commercial building as well. So inspired by this design, we know that this has been working very well. Inspired, but oh, so one thing to mention before I move on here. So this is a, 
a traditional heat pump uh, most of us have are in our houses. This is an air source heat pump, meaning our heat, heat pump takes air from outside, it processes it, and then distributes it to our houses to our comfort temperature. This comfort temperature, let's give it these numbers. My comfort temperature is 72. It's a little bit higher than uh, average <laughs> in, in, in the United States. 72, so for example, we are getting into the winter uh, season. So air gets really cold outside. So let's say it's like zero degrees. So my heat pump takes this zero and then uh, puts into this processing and then gives me 72. So it consumes an energy of, let's call it X or one, okay? So in the ground source heat pump case, we have this closed loop system. I showed you the temp temperature map, right? So the, the temperatures were around 50 degrees, 50, 55, and it's constant up to some depth. And then it starts increasing depending on the geothermal gradient. So in this case, my same heat pump, but by just doing some modifications to it, it takes 55 and then it gives me 72. The temperature difference is very low compared to the air source heat pumps. This is where I consume, my heat pump consumes less electricity. So this is how my heat pump contributes to the sustainable and renewable energy. It's not canceling it, it's not canceling the energy consumption, but it significantly reduces the consumption. So in part, inspired by this system, as civil engineers, we said, okay, so we are building foundations and we are building tunnels. We are designing foundations for bridges. So why not take advantage of the same principle and implement it in our infrastructure? So this is where, when this was the time when the energy foundations, energy tunnels, emerged okay so we can extend this concept so now we are even putting these in the landfills so in the landfills you know when you put the 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 trash the waste material it decomposes by the biological and uh, sometimes chemical processes and it's and it releases heat by installing these pipes at the base of any waste material you can actually get that heat and distribute it to wherever you want, as long as you need it. So, um, there is no limit to imagination, right? So, so this can be expanded to different, um, uh, different infrastructures. It can even be installed in wind turbines to, to cool the engine of a wind turbine. Or, it can be used to de-icing the wind turbine blades by just installing it in the, the ground, and then that loop would come up within the wind turbine shaft, and then it could just go there, you know, go up and then cool the, uh, the engine or de-ice the blade. So there are different concepts available, but it is our job and responsibility to show them, to show a proof of concept to the community, to the society that it works so that it, uh, the deployment of these systems stay increase. So now the second part, so that was a brief introduction. Do we have any questions so far? Yes. Your, the heat pump model versus geothermal model, what, what is your anticipated ener energy differentials between the two? Because as I would understand it, you would still need a compressor, you would have pumps to move the water. So there, there's either a negative or a positive there. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, the question is, what is the ground source heat pump model and geothermal model? What would be the differences? Did I understand it correctly? Yeah, differences, for example, in energy consumption. Energy consumption. So let's establish the, the common ground here. So what do we mean by ground source heat pump and geothermal system? So because Sometimes we use them interchangeably. A ground source heat pump is where you take your heat from the ground, right? So when we say geothermal, are we, con are we talking about electricity production or still heating and cooling? Heating and cooling, like mm -hmm. in a residential environment. Okay, so they're technically, uh, to me, the same things. Uh, so, um, but 
of course, so ground source heat pumps, um, so let's say um, they use the same heat pump as geothermal, um, but again, I, I'm not really sure what, what, it, what it means to you uh, when we say geothermal. Let's I, I think it. I said it wrong. I meant air over. Oh, air. Uh, an okay. air over heat pump versus okay, so ground source. What, yeah, so what we are doing here when we install a ground source heat pump, we are increasing the coefficient of performance of our heat pump. So if uh, air uh, heat source pumps, uh, if they, um, the coefficient of performance is one, when we install this ground source heat pumps, then we are increasing them to four, five, even in some cases seven. Yeah, so there is like a significant increase in the coefficient of performance. This is how we reduce the electricity uh, consumption. So I've been doing research, uh, like working on this subject since 2012. And uh, we have uh, put a lot of thought in every single aspect of the development of these systems. And right now we are pretty confident that they're working well and they're beneficial. So we, we even did some uh, life cycle analysis, how long it would take you know, for these systems to be sustainable and uh, you know, to keep that coefficient of performance constant or even at the, at the range that we want to. And we also did some cost analysis. I'm not showing them here because I wanted this one to be an introduction so that you know, we can have conversation, uh, open conversation here and with the follow-up questions. So, um, this, uh, are there any other questions? So, the affordability of this, what does that look like? Because I know like solar panels are super expensive and mm -hmm. like wind farms, that's like super expensive opposed to what we have in our own homes now. Because I grew up with geothermal, so there was like a bit of like a fluctuation there. Uh huh. So, what was the, what the, the fluctuation look like? Let's start with that it was higher in the beginning and then it like uh -huh. went lower. So it usually takes about five to six years to pay it off, pay off the construction costs. So when I first started working on this 2012, so and a water uh, source heat pump was about $20,000. But I know that it, the, the price uh, significantly decreased since then because at the beginning, uh, we haven't been paying much attention to those uh, heat pump systems to make them more efficient and affordable. But right now, so if we break down, so the reason I mentioned those like two main components, surface infrastructure and subsurface. Subsurface infrastructure, if you're utilizing a, an existing geostructure that was going to be there, like foundations, for example, um, so you're going to install your foundations anyways, right? So by just like adding a couple of loops into your concrete foundation, it will only cost you about, um, so those like pipes, high density polyethylene pipes, they are 50 cent per foot. So, and then in total, if you're using, let's say 30 meter, um, 100 feet, um, or sorry, so 60 feet long um, piles, and we run like two loops, and that would make uh, multiply by four. Uh, that would make 160 f uh, feet. And then if you just multiply it by, sorry, 0.5 dollars, and you would get $80. So you will only put $80 into the ground, right? But in the, the case of if you are drilling boreholes or trenches, of course, that's more expensive. So, um, especially drilling in Illinois is very expensive because of the glacial tooth hard, hard material that we are drilling for. But again, it varies. But, you know, to sum up, so I can elaborate more on these, uh, you know, for hours. But to sum up, uh, the construction costs, upfront costs for to install these systems or rehabilitate whatever you have in your houses, you're gonna take it back, you're, it's gonna pay off in like five to six years tops. Any other questions? Yes. I, my question is, is there a detriment to drilling into the ground for this? No, no, nothing. Like no, en no environmental impacts. Of course, that, that could be relevant, um, not for Champaign or Urbana, 
in the rural, I mean, less, uh, you know, uh, urbanized areas. But if we go up to Chicago or St. Louis, the closest, uh, or Indianapolis, so in those um, downtown areas, we, we install these four skyscrapers, right? So there's a space limitation. So we have to consider space limitation. And if we are drilling for one building, and then what's the next building is going to do, right? The building right next to you. But they're manageable uh, because of those space limitations, especially in urban areas. Um, we recommend that to install them as uh, energy foundations, not like extra drill boreholes because there are no space available. So this can be handled by that. But there are issues with that, too, which I'm going to talk about in a bit. But no environmental impacts. Because these are closed loop systems, you technically drill a borehole, you put a pipe, never seen or heard a case where a pipe breaks. Nothing. So they've been working fine. There are a lot of examples, especially in Europe. So Europe in Sweden is leading almost this uh, installation of ground source heat pumps. None, no case record, uh, reported so far. So and they've been operating for at least seven years. So it doesn't have the same like complaints that some people say for fracking or something? No. It's just So totally for the different. shallow systems, no. Okay. Oh, because it's not deep enough. Yes. Ah. Yeah, for the deep systems though, uh, of course, uh, I'm sure people in Oklahoma have been complaining a lot <laughs> because of the induced earthquakes, because of that hydraulic fracturing. Okay. All right, moving on. So what is the current state of geothermal energy development, a geothermal energy system development on the Champaign-Urbana campus of University of Illinois? So we are a group of people and we are a part of a coalition called Geoth Illinois Geothermal Coalition. So it includes a lot of a bunch of researchers, students, including my students uh, in this coalition. And this is the timeline of our geothermal development. So I'm giving this because um, when people, so we are like one of the few campuses in, in the country that have been installing this many uh, systems or working on this many projects in the country. So it all started in 2010. I was not here. <laughs> I joined around here uh, to, the, um, to the, uh, the department. And until then, there were, you see, a number of installations or feasibility studies on campus. So I, by the time I joined around here, so they were going to build a new building, or construct a new building on campus, which is called Campus Instructional Facility. So then this is here in 2000, um, mid-2019 or early 2019, Hydro Systems Laboratory. And here you're looking at reusing oil and gas wells for geothermal energy storage. So these are the, uh, so the main projects that I'm involved in. And this is like a pinpointing the locations of different, especially uh, shallow geothermals. So most of them here, all the, almost all, all these systems that were installed, um, they are uh, shallow geothermal systems, meaning for heating and cooling except for this one for electricity production. So I'm going to show you some um, installation pictures from these um, projects, different projects. And then we will elaborate how the system works, what we had to do and such, who is funding us, who is giving you know, money for us to, to do these work in a bit. So the first one is campus instru instructional facility uh, geothermal system. So um, I'm, I'm assuming many of you have been to the campus. Uh, this is Granger Engineering Library. This is Springfield Avenue. And this is uh, here, the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. And this is Tabit Laboratory. When I came here for the first time, this place was, you know, non, there was nothing. It was just like a green area. And if you go to this, uh, to the south, you would go to Green Street. So then this location was uh, specified to be uh, the campus uh, infra instructional facility. I knew that that was going to happen. And 
Uh, by the time I joined, um, there was a con conversation about installing a uh, ground source heat pump or geothermal system on, on, in this building to provide at least 65% of the energy demand, heating and cooling needs. So um, the first thing that we did, uh, because this is a big building, I'm going to show you the pictures uh, if I have them later, but the first step to any type of geothermal system in this size is to do an exploration first to determine the ground properties because how much heat you're going to extract, uh, how much heat you're going to put in the ground, it's going to be determined some material properties. So these include thermal properties, thermal conductivity and specific heat capacity to be more specific. So the higher thermal conductivity, your material will be able to transfer heat a little bit faster. The lower thermal conductivity is the reverse. If you have higher specific heat capacity, so your material will take up more heat and for the lower uh, specific heat capacity, it's the reverse. But there is a limit or there is a sweet spot that you want your material properties to be uh, for especially thermal properties so that it doesn't um, and also depending, in the ap depending on the application, you do not want uh, your heat to retain within your material in the ground for too long because if you do that, so there was a case in Wisconsin, um, it's, it's called um, Epic Systems. This is a, Epic System has a really large campus. They are operating a lot of computers and then they installed 1,000 boreholes to heat and cool the building. But their major uh, demand for the cooling, uh, major demand for the building was cooling because there were a lot of computers running, heating the building. They wanted to dump the heat into the ground. But they designed it so poorly that after one and a half years, the system stopped working because there was a decline. They were not able to put any more heat into the ground because they wanted to put the heat into the ground and dissipate it. Again, so there are like different, so the reason that we are doing is either dumping the heat. If you go to south, to Texas or Arizona, so the main heat, main demand of your building is cooling, right? Because it's, it gets really hot. So you want to be able to dissipate that heat faster enough so that for the next year or continuously, you would want to be able to put more heat into the ground. So um, dealing with such system or designing such system requires a little bit of exploration at first. So we want to gather the information. So that's why we drilled this test borehole here. Uh, and it's right next to the Granger Library and close enough to the site so that we ensure there is um, no ch change, um, nothing changes in the subsurface in terms of material properties. So we did this borehole testing and we monitored the temperature for a couple of months and we also perform an in-situ test, a field test called thermal response test to get the thermal properties. And then initially the design, so uh, when we're designing these systems, we know how my building is going to look like, right? I have all, those, all that information from structural engineer. And I know what will be the load and I go back to historical weather data and then I go back to these other buildings and collect data, their utility bills and such. And I design and say, hey, my building is going to need this much heating or cooling depending on the seasons. And then as a rule of thumb, um, one, uh, if we go like three, every three feet, we get 15 to 20 watts per meter, uh, 20, 20 watts in terms of energy uh, that we can extract or put into the ground. So then the company, the contractor, um, designed the system to have 60 individual boreholes connected to each other. 60 boreholes and they were 450 feet deep. So after this exploratory borehole, we said, no, you don't need 60. You need only 40. So that reduced the cost of the installation because drilling is expensive. So we eliminated one third of the, the number of boreholes they um, offered uh, or they uh, proposed to do. 
So here this campus is, um, of course, when you have other buildings surrounding, so there are some space limitations. And also one problem with this project was, you see this um, yellow um, thing here, yellow marks? They're tunnels. So because the main heating and cooling system on campus is supported by Abbott power plant, so they generate steam from that power plant. It's, it's operated by coal. They generate that heat and then distribute it through tunnels. So in the winter time, so the tunnels get hot because they're distributing heat. And then the, the winter time, uh, in the summer time, it's they're distributing cold, right? So the contribution of these tunnels were going to be very substantial. So then we had to cancel these tunnels. So we said, okay, we, we, we cannot operate them because this is going to impact the operational response of our own uh, system that we are designing. And of course, there were space limitations. So that's why it, the looping system, ground loops, were divided into two. So the first one is here, and the second one consisting on five by five a field in the south of campus, and then three by five field in the north of campus, party and quad. So the boreholes here are space 6.1 meter apart and drilled to a depth of 137.2 meter. It's approximately 350 feet, I guess. So the initial design was 450, but we said we, you do not need 450. But you can reduce it down to 350-ish. So the system, I just gave a lecture to our undergraduate students a couple of days ago about this system. And I took them to the mechanical room where our heat pump was. So everything is working just fine. So there are some commissioning problems. But uh, other than that, system has been operating very well. So the second project I'm going to introduce is the energy foundation installation on the new civil and environmental engineering building. So this is a very interesting project for me because when I was interviewing for this job in 2018, early 2018, there was a mention of a new building. So they were going to um, tear down a hydro systems building. It was a very old one and they were fundraising for a new building. So this is a public information. And when I was having my interview <laughs> with the department head, he all of a sudden he just like put the plans of building on in front of me and said, "Okay, so this building is going to be awesome. So this building is going to be a new building, is you know newer classrooms and everything. But also we want this to have research opportunity for us for our researchers. What would you do here?" And then, of course, uh, my expertise in geotechnical engineering, I deal with foundations. I said, are there going to be a foundation? She was like, okay, look at the plan. I saw eight plan foundations, deep foundation elements. That's okay, so what we can do here, because of the space limitations, we cannot really do ground source heat pumps, but maybe energy foundations. Here is a, the look, uh, the plan view of the foundation. This is a basement. Uh, this is the slab, uh, slab plan, actually. So you see the circles here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So initially I said, let's convert all of them. We have eight foundations. But the cost was enormous. And I said, no, 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 okay, so this shouldn't uh, be this expensive. So let's reduce it down to four. Why four? I'm gonna show you right now, because this four so the, the new building here, new civil and environmental engineering building, is connected to within brand new bridge to the existing Newmark building. So because I, know, I knew that there was going to be a research on this uh, bridge as well, because this bridge is instrumented, they're continuously collecting data from pedestrian load. And um, I said, okay, so let's make it this one complete and then utilize these four foundations here. So these are some construction pictures from the uh, foundation installation. The way this one works, when you have a foundation drilling, so you drill a shaft. So then you construct this rebar cages. They are called rebar cage. So they are like uh, you know uh, vertical rebars and hoops. And this is the common practice. 
So you lower them into the shaft and you pour your concrete and you wait for a couple of days for setup for the concrete, so then you're good. So it develops its strength. So to be able to install these foundations, it's, everything is very simple. So we just connect these U-tubes to the rebar cages. So here is another look. You see these pipes running, so they're attached to the rebar. So of course this is a research, this, was a, this also had a research component. We instrumented these rebar cages. This um, orange cable is the thermistor strings, meaning so there are um, thermistors attached to the string at different depths. So it measures temperature. So this blue one is uh, strain gauges. It measures the strain develops during heating and cooling in a foundation. And this black one is the fiber optic cable. So we did not, until we did this, there was no, almost no study or reported installations of fiber optic cables. We wanted to try because fiber optic cables are nice because they uh, provide this continuous um, measurements in the ground. Because once you put everything in the ground, you cannot go and check, right? So today we had a um, um, speaker from Federal Highway, so as the principal researcher uh, in the bridge department, he said something really nice about your technical engineers. So when you design a foundation, how would you know that it's performing? If your building is still there or bridge is still there, it's performing well, right? But there is no other metrics that you can use unless you put instrumentation in the ground and then you continue to monitor your data. So this, is this, so this system has been installed very successfully. We did analysis, design, and everything using some advanced modeling techniques. And the way that it is designed, I'm not showing it here, but these foundation loops and the heat pump, they are to he uh, heat and cool the geotechnical engineering laboratory in the new building. And uh, we establish a bypass system because this whole building is still being heated and cooled by the Abbott power plant. And we only attach this system, install the system to be able to heat and cool our geotechnical engineering laboratory so that we can showcase to our donors as well. Um, the third project, very briefly, I'm going to introduce is the use of abandoned oil and gas wells. Why abandoned oil and gas wells? Because they're abandoned, they're drilled. So when I was answering your question, we talked about drilling costs, right? So these wells are already drilled. You don't have to pay any mo anything more. And so in this project, it's uh, funded by the uh, Department of Energy. Um, especially Southern Illinois has too many abandoned wells. So if you just like drive by, you will see those like wells either like working, uh, pumping oil or gas, or even like they have these in their back people's backyards. But when a well becomes mature, it's just abandoned. It's sometimes either abandoned properly according to uh, DNR rules, DNR of uh, state of Illinois, or sometimes they just leave it like that. And they're a big hazard to the environment because they leak methane into the atmosphere. There are also sometimes there are conduits in the subsurface, from, so it escapes from these wells through the cracks. How many of you heard uh, there are a lot of lawsuits going on in Mohammed, related with Mohammed Aquifer? So people have been reporting headaches. They don't know the reason but there was a methane leak into the aquifer that would just come out from their taps. So, very significant issue. What we proposed here, okay, so these, these wells are just sitting like that, and then some of them are hazardous. So let's rehabilitate them, and then provide a system. So we have a low temperature reservoir Right, so this can be used for heating and cooling or like ground source heat pump or deep direct use. But can we produce electricity by heating this reservoir, this system here,
by increasing the temperature of the subsurface, by putting heat into it, same principle, increase the temperature to a level where we can extract these higher temperatures and then it would go to a surface structure here to produce electricity. So um, this project has finished. Uh, the first step was to provide feasibility, to show people that it may work. How would I know that it was going to work? Of course, I had to go to the field and do some testing. So we went to Southern Illinois. We designed a field experiment on a well here. So we had a heater here, heating tank. So we had the water or um, fluid, brine, that we pumped up from the reservoir. So then we pumped this heated fluid into the subsurface. Of course, we instrumented this again with pressure and temperature sensors, which are needed for our uh, design, um, advanced design modeling purposes. And here is the rig. So we also put a um, fiber optic cable to, to measure the pressure and temperature. But in this, this time, because this extends to almost 1,000 meter, which is about um, 3,000 feet, right? Yeah, 3,000 feet into the subsurface. So we first plug the well, the perforated, because we didn't want that oil. So oil and gas is somewhere here. We didn't want that oil and gas to interfere with our experiment. We sealed it and we used this portion of the well. And so these are some pictures when we were lowering uh, the DTS cable, which is called distributed temperature sensing system and such. So then we collect, we perform this experiment, we injected heat, then we measured the temperature over time and we took those um, data and we went to the office and we did some advanced design modeling and then we, s we came up, our results show that it is feasible to use such low temperature system by increasing the temperature using as a geothermal storage system. So where would this heat come from? It could come from waste heat that from industry usage. It could come from, um, you know, solar because solar produces energy. Solar energy produces electricity during day, but so at night no one needs it, right? So we could potentially uh, transform that electricity into heat and then we could inject this in the heat form to increase the temperatures. So this was again a successful project. We, didn't, we are working now to expand the installation to, um, to have that bigger system to actually operate uh, a such system. So these efforts are all, trust me, is just talking to Department of Energy especially, back and forth, and trying to convince them because as a researcher you have an idea and then you provide a hypothesis and say, okay, if this is true, this system or this conceptual, um, this concept is going to work. It only takes one person to believe in your ideas. And then, you know, of course, to do this, you need funding. So we were successful, we finished the project, we, support, uh, we submitted our report, so everything as well. So, so that was the second part of my uh, presentation. But of course, we are promoting this um, deployment, so let's have more systems, more and more and more. But of course, we need to consider some, there are some design considerations that we be careful about. And also, like we were discussing, space limitations. So for example, if I'm in Chicago and then I'm installing an energy foundation system because those energy foundations is not one, so it's a hundred. We're talking about a hundred. Imagine the amount of heat a building needs for it, like a skyscraper. So who is going to regulate that heat, for example? Right? So because heat is not considered as a natural resource. So um, so multiple mines, oil and gas, they are considered as a natural resource and they're regulated by DNRs. But who's, who's regulating heat? No one. So if you take, let's say, X amount of heat for your building, 
what is the next building, the building right next to you is going to do. One of the major problems is these ground source heat pumps. If you take too much heat, so these are working in, you know, less densely populated areas, like here. So we have enough space and we have like big backyards. But um, so one of the major problems with these, uh, especially in the des design and operation, freezing the ground. Imagine if, you're, if you take too much heat, then you will be freezing you because you will be decreasing the temperature by a lot. And then that freezing is going to cause some uh, structural integrity issues in your foundations. And if you do that in a cyclic um, manner or cyclic regime, so you will probably have foundation failures. So there, would, there should be a limit, but at the moment, no one's regulating that limit. So economics of the system, like you guys mentioned. So, um, so we're still performing life cost analysis, life cycle analysis. How much, how long is my system is going to, is it going to have any, you know, um, failure issues like cracking of the pipes and such. And also, like I mentioned uh, in my, um, when I was talking about energy foundations, familiarity with the concept is very important. If someone, like, you know, a contractor doesn't know what to do, it could cost you a lot of money. Of course, you wouldn't go to a contractor that who doesn't know, you know, you, you, who doesn't know what's going to do. But this system that we installed was probably, you know, um, let's say if it was going to cost $1, it cost us like $3. But of course, it, because this was a research uh, project, so there were some multiple people willing to fund it. So um, what else? Varying ground profiles. We said that ground temperatures are the most important design parameters. So yes. So you were talking about the uh, pushback from contractors on this and unfamiliar with system. What kind of resources are available on like the vocational side to educate people how to do this, how to install these systems correctly? Mm -hmm. uh, there are standards uh, established by ASHRAE. I don't know. I do not know the, the full, you know, I only know the acronym. But there are standards established by mechanical engineers. So because mecha so mechanical engineers design the heat pump and we designed the ground loop. But mechanical engineers have been designing the ground loops as well. So that's why they establish a standard. So you can just follow those standards and you can design your system. But as civil engineers, what we do, we say, okay, those modeling or design considerations for the mecha from mechanical engineers, they aren't representative of ground conditions exactly. So with our work, for example, so when I was introducing campus infra in instructional facility, so they, 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 said, they told us, okay, there will be 60, right? Because they follow the ASHRAE design. Mm -hmm. But when we did the testing and we um, characterized the ground property, we said, no, you don't need 60, you need only 40. So there are standards established. So International Heat Pump Association, ground, so International Ground Source Heat Pump Association, there's ASHRAE. So those standards could be followed, but um, like the other system I mentioned, EPIC systems failures, so that's the big fail. So when you hear about those failures, so people tend to be hesitant about them, right? So because they think, okay, this is not going to work, but that's not the case. It's just like a, um, if you do your design well, if you hire you know, people who know what they're doing, your system is not going to fail at all. So when I went to New York City three, four years ago, so I was talking with our partners, which is like one of the major donors of this new building, it's a main, mainly foundation company, they designed the foundations. When I went there, we were you know, chatting with the, the president of the company, and then we were, we were chatting about geothermal. And then he also told me, as a geotechnical engineer, told me, oh, Tuche, these systems don't work. No, they work, but tell me more about it. Tell me what happened. So, you know, I try to do my best, you know, to, to, to educate, uh, you know, con contracts. Because when we were designing, when we were actually installing the energy foundations on, on the hydro systems building, 
So contractors were like, okay, I, I was, they were giving, giving me the looks and, you know, and the feel. They were like, are you the one who are making us to do this? I'm like, yes, I'm the one, but it's simple. Trust me, you know. So we have our individual efforts that we, we've been putting, but there are also standards. But that's a very good point, actually. As a, uh, I'm a member of the Foundation Institute. So we have an environmental sustainability group. So we've been developing, um, you know, some um, lectures. So we do training. So as a group of people, and we do not, you know, we don't get any money. So you, they only register, people only register for their expenses, very like minimum uh, registration fee. Um, th they are also available online. So we are, we are right now trying to develop those online resources for people as well. Are you? Sure. <coughs> So last, in my last slide, I know we're a little bit over time, but I, I'm assuming that you're enjoying the talk. Um, path forward. So these are the action items that were designated and decided by a group of people, including myself uh, for Department of Energy. So there are different action areas like regulatory processes, the process optimization, for example, that I was just talking about who's gonna take how much, right? Action area three, for example, maximizing the full value of geothermal energy. How can we make these systems more efficient? Action area four, improve stakeholder collaboration. So these action items, they are established by the feedback that, you know, Department of Energy um, regulators that get from us. Um, so we are doing our best to improve these systems. But I think the major, I want you to go home with two major information. The first one is these systems work and we do not have any environmental issues. They're renewable and sustainable, period. And the second one is, I think this would be also my per, a little bit personal uh, perspective. Let's not be afraid. Let's not get scared for, this, for the things that we don't know. So let's not be judgmental. And let's just try to you know, research a little bit, read a little bit if there's any examples of a system, for example, we are talking about geothermal systems. And we try to gather more information. Let's make an informed decision before we um, you know, think that it's not going to work or it's going to work. It works both way for me. Well, thank you so much for your attention um, and then for the great questions. If you have more, I'm happy to answer. Um, so if you don't, it's okay too. I included my contact information here. If anything comes up, please give me a call or send me an email. Um, I'm always respons responsive to my emails and calls. So I've been getting the, you know emails from across the country, trust me. And I, um, you know, reply to every single of them. So thank you so much for your attention.